Well, welcome to our class. We're going to get underway. We're studying that third primeval rebellion. We've had two weeks on this. This is the last week on that particular study. You might remember that when we use the word primeval, we're talking about Genesis chapter 1 through, uh, through uh, 11. And uh, we've been examining particularly the Tower of Babel event. We've looked at uh, that along with Genesis chapter 10. We've been in Deuteronomy 32. We have looked at as well Psalm 82 in this regard. So by way of review, I'm going to give you that in a minute. And, but, but first we're going to pray. Let me just tell you about where we're going tonight. Um, we're going to finish this out this evening regarding that third primeval rebellion. And this actually closes out the study with respect to the powers of darkness. Next week we will be moving into the study of the heavenly host. So we'll be moving there next week. <clears throat> we have spent a lot of time regarding the powers of darkness. And the reason for that, as I told you many, many months back, it's because there is a lot more said about them. And that's the reason for that. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, again, this time to come together and to study your word. We thank you for your mercy and your kindnesses to us, Lord, that you've called us into your kingdom. You've given us the ability, Lord, to have eyesight, to read, to listen. And we have access to your scriptures, Lord, and we're very grateful for that. In addition, we, we didn't have any impediment in coming here this evening for the purpose of study. Uh, there are many Christians around the globe tonight that cannot do that. We pray for them at this time. Be with your church wherever it is in the world that's being oppressed. We're talking about oppression in the studies that we're in. And we realize the forces of this, of this darkness, as Paul calls them, uh, work against the work of the kingdom every single day. So we're grateful that we have this moment. We pray you'd bless our time. Please bless me. Take over my feeble lips, Lord, to convey what it is that's most important this evening. And may you receive all of the honor and the glory that is due to you alone, the Most High God. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so by way of uh, review... We've been studying the, the Babel event, the Tower of Babel event, and its interface with Psalm 82, that portion of Scripture where we have God absolutely condemning these lesser Elohim for poor ruling status over the nations. The judgment at Babel altered the relationship between God and the nations. In effect, what happens is, is that God divorces himself from humanity and begins anew with Abraham, which is the beginning of Israel. The beginning of that is the beginning of chapter 12. Things change then. So Babel ends at chapter 11, and then when we get to chapter 12, everything's focused on Abraham, who comes out of nowhere. There's nothing about him that we can look at that say, says there that he's a great spiritual man. He's basically an idol-carrying pagan. And God calls him and says that I'm going to make out of you a new nation, a nation for myself. So the focus that from Genesis chapter 1 all the way up through chapter 11 had been on all of humanity. God was patiently waiting there for repentance to take place, but it didn't. And essentially, at that time is when we have this divorce happening. So let me, continuing by way of review, I'll put it on the screen, Genesis chapter 12. This is the call to Abraham, the initial statement by God. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That could also be translated, all the families of the nations. Now what's interesting here is, you've got this divorce of humanity, and now God focusing down on one man that he's going to make a new nation of, 
And the rest of biblical uh, history throughout the whole Old Testament is focused on this one people group from which will come the Christ. But even in the call of Abraham, it's noting here, the, divorce, the nations have been set aside, but God did not forget them. In you, all the nations of the earth will be, will be blessed, or all the families of the nations will be blessed. So they're set aside for a season, but the plan is to bring them back in at the proper time. There is no Old Testament indication that at the end of chapter 11, an indication that the divine sons of God who were put over the nations were fallen at the time that they were given that responsibility. Now we've looked at several texts on this in previous weeks regarding this is, answers the question, how did the powers of darkness come to have regional authority? The answer is God put them there. But they became corrupt, and instead of guiding those nations and encourage them towards that which is good and honorable and righteous, it was exactly the opposite. They were drunk for self-worship, they went their own way, and that's how we ended up with Psalm 82 and the condemnation of them. Later, these same sons of God inspire mankind to worship the heavenlies. We're talking here about the sun, the moon, the stars. God did not intend that this false worship would take place or be sanctioned by these dele delegated divine overseers. Did God know what would happen? Absolutely. This ultimately is part of the ordination will of God, the hidden will of God, but at the time, as it was coming out in, in real time, they were assigned this responsibility. Now, God abhorred the worship of false gods within Israel and the nations outside of the Jewish people. This is a general condemnation of all false god worship. Note the following commands, then, that Moses gives in Deuteronomy. I've mentioned to you a number of times that Deuteronomy really is a collection of sermons that uh, Moses gave to the people of Israel. And this list that I'm going to give you now is in addition to the ones that I highlighted in Lesson 15. Again, Psalm, uh, this, is, this is actually Psalm 97, which is picked up by Moses at a later point, but let me just quote it to you. Let all those be ashamed who serve graven images, who boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Worship him. And then we have it in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Pretty sober warning here to the people. If there is found in your midst, in any of your towns, which the Lord your God is giving you, a man or a woman who does what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God by transgressing his covenant and has gone and served other gods and worshiped them or the sun, or the moon, or any of the heavenly host, which I have not commanded. And if it is told you that you have heard it, then you shall inquire thoroughly. Behold, if it is true, and the thing certain that this detestable thing has been done in Israel, then you shall bring out that man or that woman who has done this evil deed to your gate. That is, the man or the woman, and you shall stone them to death. Okay? This is a capital offense. This is one of 30 capital offenses articulated in the book of the law. And this is one of these ones with respect to this idea of worshiping pagan deities. I mean, God is not messing around with this. There's going to be a reckoning with regard to humanity on this, there's also going to be a reckoning in the heavenlies as well. Now, some more texts. Uh, they're in my notes. Uh, they're Deuteronomy chapter 12, Deuteronomy 18, Deuteronomy 20, Deuteronomy 29. For the sake of time, I didn't include those, but it's the same motif. You're not to be worshiping these gods that are around you. The gods allotted to the nations are false and lead to the stumbling of human beings. Here's the prophet Jeremiah, many centuries later, looking back on this. Jeremiah 18, beginning at verse 15. For my people have forgotten me, 
They burn incense to worthless gods, and they have stumbled from their ways, from the ancient paths, to walk in bypaths and not a highway. In other words, they're on the wrong road. And these roads are dead ends that lead none other to destruction here. Notice the language here, have stumbled. Have stumbled. We have ancient versions of this that actually render the Hebrew, cause them to stumble. So it would read this way. They burn incense to worthless gods that have caused them to stumble. Remember, I have said to you, the issue here is they can't make humanity sin, but they can foment it. They can encourage it. They can abet it. And that's exactly what they end up doing. The worship of these gods is false. We already have it here in Psalm 97. I already read it once. Let all those be ashamed who serve graven images, who boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Gods is also rendered here as supernatural powers. This leads us to Acts. We covered this last week. This is a sermon of Paul to the Athenians. It's an evangelistic message. It's not given to the church. Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 26. He made from one man every nation on mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. As I noted for you last week, this is talking about the period of time before Abraham is called in chapter 12. This is when God's waiting. And as I closed out that message last week, I, I said to you, what's the theological messaging here? I mean, we were going by many, many years. There's no turning. There's no turning. There's no turning. The point is, they don't turn. They can't turn because they're dead in their sin. That's the part to get it down that our salvation itself is the result of the work of God. And if it wasn't the work of God that awakened us to hear and see, we would be just lost. We don't get it. We don't get it. God intended his divorce from humanity would be a stimulus to seek him. In other words, a right relationship. Israel would be the conduit. But the biblical record depicts nothing but hostility to Israel and a deliberate worship of these lesser gods. Human depravity fomented by lesser Elohim results in greater wickedness. And as we see the biblical record, we see that unfold. The divorce by God of the nations was real, but he still wanted those created in his image to be ruled justly by lesser Elohim. This did not happen. Now we've got it back on the screen. Psalm 82, here we go. God has taken his place in the divine council. It's a judgment setting here. It's Nuremberg, you know? We're going we're gonna to judge the Nazis here, except in this case, it's much more serious. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fallenness. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the, land, the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. He's talking about humanity here. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Here it comes. I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. There you've got it again. That promise, the nations are at need to be brought back in. It would take centuries for that to be realized. Okay? Take centuries for that to happen. But it would happen. And it would go forth. And we are all a part of that as a result. 
The, the psalmist cries out here, inherit the nations. Again, verse 8, arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. Michael Heiser writes on that point. He says, the reference to the gods of Yahweh's counsel as sons of the Most High aligns completely with the apportionment of the nations by the Most High among his sons. The Hebrew term translated here, inherit, is the same as translated as inheritance in Deuteronomy 32. I've got it on the screen. We looked at this last week. A sermon of Moses harking back to the event of the divorce. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders according to the sons of God. This is the problem. They were put in charge... They weren't fallen at the time, but they became corrupt. In this sense, I think we probably could look at them in the same position as was Adam in the garden. It's a little different, but let me make the point. When Adam was placed in the garden, Adam had no predisposition to not believe the will of God. There was nothing there. There was no nature within Adam as it is with us. It's biased towards wanting to go our own way or believe our own message or the message of anybody else. His nature hadn't been corrupted, and yet he fell. He was on probation. If he did this, he lived. If he did that, he would die, and he plunged himself as well as humanity into that. In a sense, these sons of God, they are put in positions of authority, they have no predisposition towards evil, and yet they fell. Massive corruption. And when we, you read in the scripture now that the heavens are in turmoil, anything about heaven not being in order, this is what it's talking about. Things are not in order. And there's no way for that rebellion that affected all of those lesser Elohim for them to be restored. We've talked about that a number of times. There's no help for them. But it will be righted, and this judgment will be carried out. They are condemned for the chaos that they have fomented within the nations. While, while commenting on Jeremiah, which I read earlier, John Geyer writes in his work, Desolation and Cosmos, he writes this. He says, when Jeremiah extols Yahweh as king over the nations, he records that the earth trembles. The final stage of the desolation of the earth is the complete disillusion of the universe. The lords of heaven are thrown into confusion by the general chaos. Sun, moon, and stars no longer give their light, and the world is plunged in, a in darkness. He cites on that Isaiah chapter 13, as well as Ezekiel chapter 32. So, there, there, when we talk about the end and the wrapping up of the biblical record of, of biblical history, heading into the book of Revelation, however God is bringing that all out, I mean, there's a, a setting right of everything that's in the earth. There's also a setting right of everything that needs to take place in the heavenlies as well. Revelation 21, verse 1. I've given you this before. It's on the screen. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. This answers the question, well, why would heaven need to be rebuilt? This is the answer for that. Now, that's the review. Now we're moving into new material. This leads us to a very interesting study in regards to these lesser Elohim and their purview over these geographic regions. Michael Heiser's term for this is called cosmic geography. Cosmic geography. The point here is that Israel was completely isolated. Actually, when you think about it today, it's very similar. I mean, every, all the nations that are around the nation of Israel are very hostile to its existence. I mean, there are some nations that are given over that, you know, they would be just as happy as if there was a nuclear bomb put there and the whole nation was expunged. Israel has always been in this position. The nation would be surrounded on all sides by pagan lands whose lesser gods were corrupt and would expend all effort to destroy Yahweh's allotted heritage. 
See, they know that. Again, keep in mind, if you destroy the heritage, if you destroy the people of Israel, then the he that was promised to come in Genesis 3.15 isn't going to get there. The battle plan number A, or letter A, was annihilate them. Of course, battle plan B, as I articulated to you, would have been if you can't annihilate them, then corrupt the seed of the woman with the seed of the serpent. Now, many Old Testament events seem odd to modern readers, but when you have the idea of this cosmic geography in mind, all of a sudden it makes sense. This is, this is a lesson where we're going to be hitting some of these Old Testament passages and we just look at this and we just say, you know, we turn our heads sideways. And, well, I don't know. I mean, it just seems kind of weird. Now, as I said, Heiser uses the term cosmic geography. I don't like it as much. I, I coined my own word. It's not in your notes. You'd have to write it down. It's called geographical dominion. Heiser uses the word cosmic to convey the idea that there are things going on in the heavenlies, that there is a, a heavenly assignment. I get that. But I like this idea better, geographical dominion. Obviously, when we use the word geographical, I mean we're talking about land, right? And dominion indicates control. So when I use the term geographical dominion, I'm talking about these areas where these lesser Elohim exercise their purview of control and oversight. That's what I mean by it. In, an act, in that sense, it's very similar to Heiser. So let's look at these. Number one. The first one concerns 1 Samuel chapter 26. This is a story about David that's being driven away from Israel, okay? The land of where the, the promised land is. And we pick it up, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 19. This is David speaking. Now, therefore, please let my Lord the king listen to the words of his servant. He's talking to Saul. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is men cursed, are they before the Lord? For they have driven me out today so that I would have no attachment with the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. Now, with what you've had so far, we can begin to make heads or tails out of this. David is being thrown out, okay? In this sense, he's like Moses being thrown out of, of Egypt, okay? He's being thrown out of the land, and David's basically saying, if you throw me out, you're essentially saying to me, go serve other gods. What gods? The gods of these nations, these lesser Elohim that were put in power that now are fallen and are enemies of Yahweh, David recognizes the place to worship Yahweh is in the promised land because it was given to him for that. Keep in mind also, what's the most significant thing inside the promised land? The tabernacle. And the tabernacle was the central place of worship. Okay? David here describes himself as being driven away, quote, from the inheritance of Yahweh. And David notes that Saul and his minions have expelled him to, quote, go serve other gods. Outside of Israel, the land is under control of lesser Elohim. Now, this is one of these interesting parts of this, that even though these lesser Elohim are fallen, and even though they have been judged, which hasn't been carried out yet, God still respects their purview. Isn't this interesting? Now, could God supersede that? Of course. And there are times that he does. But he didn't just make them go away. He didn't wash them out here. This leads Richard Phillips in his commentary on 1 Samuel to write this. He says, this, it's on the screen. This statement reflects the theology at work in the Old Testament since one needed to worship God at his tabernacle to benefit from the atoning sacrifices made there. Saul was driving David into the cursed condition of paganism. 
by depriving him of God's sacred ordinances. Now, couldn't we reason to ourselves? Couldn't we say, what difference would it make? So he sent him out east or west or south. <clears throat> God's the God over all the nations on the whole globe. I mean, couldn't he worship God in those places? The understanding was, no. Those lands hadn't been conquered. The promised land had been conquered. God went to war, not only against the people groups that we've highlighted in the past, he went to war over the gods of those regions that those people groups were serving. Ronald Youngblood, in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, very respected, he says this, in ancient times it was commonly believed that to be driven from one's homeland was tantamount to leaving one's god and being forced to serve other gods, the gods of the alien territory of exile. Is this incredible? Ralph Davis, Dale Ralph, Ralph Davis writes on this. He says, Yahweh's face, or his presence, was especially seen in the sanctuary. Yet David was being driven away and cut from the tabernacle and sacrifices from priest and to festival. He was being shut out of the land and sanctuary where Yahweh met with his people. To be cut off from the ordinances of public worship is David's most severe grief. He writes, would that cause me anguish? Christians have surpassed David in privileges, but few have approached him in appetite. You know, here's, here's, here's a whole series of sermons on the importance of Sunday morning. Here's a whole series of sermons on the importance of wa worshiping God and not St. Mattress on Sunday morning. God commands us to assemble. It's not an option. You know, unless we're ill, or we're away, we, sh we should be there. And so here we have this first text dealing with David, where he's being exiled, and the exile for him meant, I won't be able to worship Yahweh. Now, do we see this anymore? Yeah, we do. Here we go. Second Kings. Interesting story here. You've got, you've got Nahum, who's a pagan, Okay, who has leprosy. Do you remember this story? And he receives a healing for that. And so he knows Yahweh has healed him. So he says to Elisha, I'm in chapter 5, beginning of verse 17, Nahum said, if not, please let your servant at least be given, listen to this, two mules load of earth. Could be translated dirt. For your servant will no longer offer burnt offerings, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon, when I bow myself in that house of Ramon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said to him, that is Elisha, go in peace. So he departed from him at a distance. So what you've got here is a man who's not an Israelite, who has been healed. No question in his mind. God did this. The God of Israel, the Most High did this. Now I'm going back home and I'm in service to a pagan king who worships pagan gods. And there's no place to worship Yahweh there. Can you possibly excuse me if I end up in the temple of a pagan god, Ramon, that when I'm offering up a worship, a worship there, I can do, bring me, let, let me, please let me bring back a couple wheelbarrow loads of dirt so I can have my own place. This dirt has been consecrated. It's Yahweh's dirt. I want to bring it back with me so I have a place that I can worship him. 
Nahum, the Samir, Samir, Assyrian commander here, was healed of leprosy and then asked for Elisha permission to carry the dirt from Israel back to his home country. Nahum recognized the lordship of Yahweh over all gods and pledged to sacrifice only to him. Since Yahweh was to be worshipped in his own land, Nahum then asked, May I carry dirt from Israel so Yahweh may be worshipped in his own land still ruled by lesser Elohim. You see this? Is this incredible? This leads Philip Graham Riken, Reformed Expository Commentary. He writes on this. He says, It almost sounds as if Nahum is asking for permission to compromise his faith by worshiping idols. Yet he is solid in his commitment to worship God alone. He wants to take a wheelbarrow full of the promised land back with him so that he can build an altar to the living God. Nahum's faith is genuine. He will not sacrifice to any other God. You see, as we're reading along, you're going through the Old Testament. It's talking about, let me take some dirt back. And we're looking at this, what in the world? What are you going to do with dirt? And not just a little bit of dirt. You know, where it's a memento. I remember that scene in that, you know, graphic movie, uh, Saving Private Ryan, where one of the soldiers, after they had made the D-Day uh, landing, uh, was taking some uh, tobacco tins, like the size of a shoe can, uh, shoe polish, and was putting sand in there. And he had written with a marker on top of that, uh, France. And he had other ones that were in his bag from Italy and other places. They, they were mementos. This is no memento. He wants to bring back a couple of mules worth of dirt. Then there's a scene of the, the, the Ark of the Covenant ends up in the land of Philistines. We'll pick that up at 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. The, 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 the ark ends up in the wrong place, right? 1 Samuel chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Now the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Does that ring a bell for anybody? You remember that city? Okay. Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up by Dagon. When the Ashdodites arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him, again, right side up in his place again. But when they arose early in the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both of the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor all who entered Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. Now what's going on there? The Ark of the Covenant here had been captured by the Philistines and taken to Dagon's temple. In less than 24 hours, Dagon's idol had been reduced to a stump. There's no head, no hands, right? Note how Dagon's priests refused to walk over the ground where Yahweh had destroyed Dagon. This was a case even though the space was in Dagon's temple. The ground here had been conquered by Yahweh. This particular ground, this particular, don't mess with that. And then we get to a text that we've looked at many times that comes out of Daniel. We pick it up there, Daniel chapter 10. Daniel seeing these great visions about how the end is going to come about and the wrapping up of biblical history as it relates to Israel. We pick it up, chapter 10, beginning at verse 13, also verse 20. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me. 
for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Verse 20, then he said, do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia, so I am going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. The princes are supernatural beings ruling over lands previously allotted by Yahweh to the sons of God, the lesser Elohim. That's what's going on here. Were they fallen when they were allotted the charge? No. But they became corrupt. How? They were drunk for self-worship. What's in it for me? They were supposed to be conduits of people's worship going up to Yahweh. I would argue that same thing as their, their leader in Satan, but they're holding it back. It's like a teller in a bank. Guy's taking a deposit, you know? Got $6,000 here on deposit. It's not gonna miss $65 out of that. Is he? Just a little bit for me. Just a little bit. Daniel 10, verse 13, again. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Note the plural at the end. The kings of Persia. He's dealing with many here. And it took Michael, one of the chief princes, to come to help him. Now, we'll learn this next week. Michael is Israel's chief priest. Michael has charred. I'm sorry? Prince, not priest. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Not priest, prince. Michael is Israel's prince that looks after them. And we'll see that at strategic times. He's there to help. Daniel chapter 10, verse 21. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael. Notice the possessive here, your prince. Okay, he definitely has that responsibility. Daniel 12, verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people. There you've got the job description. That's what he's doing. Will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never has occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who was found written in the book, will be rescued. Okay? So we're not dealing with the biblical record here of the prophetic uh, utterances of Daniel and how that all comes to play, that's beyond the scope of the class. But right now, all I'm doing is calling to your attention that these powers are in place there. They continue in place, okay? They continue in place. This leads uh, John Collins in his commentary on Daniel to write the following, it's on the screen. By analogy with Michael, it is clear that the princes of Greece and Persia are the patron angels of these nations. The notion that different nations were allotted to different gods or heavenly beings was widespread in the ancient world. The origin of this, the prince idea, is to be sought in the ancient Near Eastern concept of what? You guessed it, divine counsel. The existence of national deities is assumed and Rabashakath taunt. Who among all the gods of the countries has delivered their countries out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? It comes from 2 Kings. I've got it on the screen. Here again, 2 Kings 18, verse 35. Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their land from my hand? The Lord shall deliver Jerusalem from my hand. So th there's an understanding here that if God decides to do something in one of these pagan lands, it's going to happen. But if it's not part of the near-term plan, they are continuing in power. Unless God conquers it in some way. Isaiah chapter 36, verse 20. Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their hand from my hand that the Lord would deliver Jerusalem from my hand? 
This leads Hartman and Delilla in the book of Daniel. Uh, it's a commentary. They write on this. The prince of the kingdom of Persia mentioned twice in 1013 and called simply the prince of Persia in chapter 10 verse 20, listen carefully, is not King Cyrus or a corporate person resenting a group of, per, of kings of Persia as Calvin and most of the reformers thought, but is rather a tutelary spirit or a guardian angel of the Persian kingdom as the rabbis and most Christian commentators have rightly acknowledged. The belief in guardian angels for nations is a survival of an ancient polyistic theology which held that each city, state, or nation, or empire had a tutelary God who was in a particular way its protector, enjoying in return special status and cultic recognition. As in former times, the patron God looked after these interests of the nation in his charge. So in orthodox monotheistic circles, the guardian angel was thought to be commissioned by the one God to see to it that the affairs of the state ran smoothly. If anything went wrong in the nation, then the guardian angel could be blamed for the lack of wisdom or skill. And in no way, God would be excused uh, would be excused from any charge of mismanagement. To preserve the basic Israelite tenet, let me get that real quick. The basic tenet of monotheism, guardian angels were made subject to, the God, to God's supreme authority. That's basically how it worked, okay? Now, the big difference that has happened since the cross and the resurrection is that the blocking of the gospel going out, the, the truths that are there have been lifted. This is why Jesus gives that commission, go ye into the world and preach the gospel to all nations. Here you have it, back to Abraham, in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. But look at the centuries of time that would take in biblical revelation for this to be realized. And once Jesus disarms them, and we've looked at passages in the New Testament that say that clearly, that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities of this age. That disarming is what gives us confidence to go into these nations and preach the gospel. And that has been the message since Acts chapter 2. I mean, that's what's been going on. Now, we're going to learn what supercharged this in the past as far as the evangelism work of Israel, excuse me, of the, of, uh, the people of God, is the absolute destruction of Israel as a nation and the temple. We will examine that in the next lesson as we deal with the host of heaven. That ended up catapulting the church out to do evangelism in a tremendous way. So we've got these passages of scripture that in the past I think we kind of rolled over them as we're doing our biblical reading and not quite kind of making heads or tails out of what they meant. But then when we go on to it a little bit further we understand that no, this is part of this issue that started at the Tower of Babel when God divorced the nations, ends up picking one guy, I'm not going to deal with you, there's been no repentance here, I'm going to build my own nation, and I will look after him myself. But I will bring it back so that the nations are not completely forgotten. But it would take a long time for that to be known. Now, I want to break in my lesson because um, we would be uh, going into uh, the sad story of the Danites. I'm going to hold that to the end. What I want you to do is I want you to go to the end of your lesson notes and you'll see there a chart that I've been telling you about for the last several weeks. Now, for those of you that are viewing this online, Okay. If you've been watching this on the broader-based YouTube, 
you're not going to be able to pull up this chart, and we don't have it. It's too much data to get on a PowerPoint. So what you need to do is if you're viewing it online on YouTube, you need to go to my website. And it's a simple address, itmdg.org, okay? International Theological Mission Don Gallardi, that's what it stands for, itmdg.org. You go there, you go to the selection bar, you click on Unseen Realm, the whole class will come up in front of you. You skip down to this lesson, what you're going to find there, if you click on the title of the class, you can pull up my teaching notes for every single class that's been given. And the, we, the video is right there too, you can click on that, but for this class, this chart, there'll also be a, 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 a citation put there for you to click on, and then you can pull up this exact chart if you've been watching online, same one that's been given to the students that are with me right now. Okay, so I was trying to think of a way to pull this all together for you guys so that you'd be able to see this. So I got this idea in my mind of trying to come up with a way to do this on one page, and this is what I was able to come up with. Thank you to Barb Barnum who helped me with the typing and for my dear beloved Debbie, my faithful scribe who put some finishing touches on it as well. Okay, so if you look at the top, chronology of lesser Elohim fallings who became the powers of darkness. There have been a number of these fallings. So what I'm gonna do is work you from left to right and we're gonna see right in front of you on this timeline that moves from left to right all of these different fallings that took place. So, we start in creation on the left-hand side, Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Pretty easy to look at there. Then we get to the first rebellion. The first rebellion there, and uh, these are primeval rebellions, and I'm using uh, Michael Heiser's language here of the first rebellion, second rebellion, and third rebellion. That's his, I've noted that on the, um, on the uh, chart, bottom left-hand corner, but the development of the chart is mine. So. The first rebellion, we've got the serpent, okay? He shows up in chapter three. He falls before that, when? Well, we don't know. I mean, was it immediate? Was it real close to the time that he went into a discussion with Eve? We don't know. But his fall into becoming his own God as opposed to Yahweh happened sometime before that conversation that takes place in Genesis chapter three and we have the fall of man. The thing you want to see here is you've got man plunged into sin, his decision, but lured, fomented, abetted by the serpent, okay? Then we move to the second rebellion. I'm at the top, moving down. You'll see there in the note, some of the sons of God fall. How many? We don't know. What do they do, okay? This occurs sometime during the days of Jared and Enoch, and they end up copulating with women. And as a result of that, you keep moving a little further over, you see the Nephilim are produced, and you see below that, they are giants, Genesis 6, 4. Okay, so we've got, we've got a falling of Satan here. Now we've got some of the sons of God fall and created this mess that happened in Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 4. We have the Nephilim produced here. Then we have the flood, and the flood destroys all the creatures. And those that were a part of that rebellion of the sons of God that copulated with these women, you see the next large era there, sons of God in prison, you take that down, where do we know that? Here we got it, 1 Peter 3, Jude 6, 2 Peter 2, you also have it in the non canonical book of 1 Enoch 10, which I've been arguing those New Testament writers are interacting with his material there, okay? That's that. Now we get to the third rebellion. We've just finished that. The third rebellion happens at the end of chapter 11 when God says he's going to work with one man, that's Abraham, and he delegates the nations to lesser gods. Okay? But we have that in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 8 and 9. And it's at the same time period as the Tower of Babel. You see that, Genesis 10 and 11. Now, 
moving left to right over time, they fall into self-worship. Well, when? I, we don't know. I mean, was it, was it one day? Was it, what, did they all fall at the same? We don't know. There's no information on that. But at some point in time, they fall into self-worship. And then as a result of that, below the center line, God judges them. You've got that in Psalm 82. And they have been sentenced as a result of Psalm 82, but their demise is yet future. It hasn't been carried out yet, okay? Then moving forward, we're past now the first, second, and third rebellions. That's primeval history, Genesis 1 through 11. Then that brings us to the patriarchal period. You'll see that at the top, Genesis 12 through, it has Genesis 12, I guess see that needs to be changed there, uh, through verse 50, through chapter 50. There should be a zero on the end of that five. Okay, so we come down there, and the first area you see, lesser gods control the nations. Okay, now Moses notes this. You'll see that below the line there. He notes their power, Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 20, Deuteronomy 12. There's a lot more than that that talk about this. They're, they're, they become corrupt, okay? And then there is a second fall of additional sons of God. These are not the same groups that have been put over the nations. This happens again somewhere in the heavenlies where they repeat the same thing that happened before Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4. They end up copulating with women. How do we know this? We know it because the Nephilim end up in the promised land and have to be eradicated. So there had to be a secondary fall somewhere in there. It can't be the first guys that were involved in that. They're locked up. We already have seen that. So once again, what do they do? They copulate with women, and what do they do? That results in they produce more Nephilim. We've got that in Numbers chapter 13. You see the reference there. The Anakim, we looked at this. The Raphaim, the Zamzumim, the Horites, the Amorites. These are all, you see it there at the bottom, they're all giant clans that controlled the promised land. And total annihilation is ordered by Moses. You've got it there, two references, Deuteronomy 2 and also Deuteronomy chapter 20. They have to be destroyed. They have to be destroyed. They're occupying the land. It's a defensive posture. They've got it covered from the south. They've got it covered from the east. They've got it covered from the north. Everything is in the promised land. Again, two-pronged attack. A, you're going to kill the seed of the woman, or B, we're going to pollute it with serpentine seed. God says, you do not make any treaties with these people, and you do not suffer anything to live. Total annihilation. The Hebrew word karam is carried out there and they're absolutely destroyed. This is the reason why. Now, what happened to those sons of God? Presumably, they ended up the same as the first ones did. But we don't know that. We don't have any record of that. Okay? I'm, I'm supposing that is the case. But nonetheless, there it is. Then we get into the book of Joshua and we find that the Nephilim control Canaan. Okay, all of those, those people groups, again, the Anakim, the Raphaim, the Zamzumim, the Horites, the Amorites, they're all there. These giant clans are all over the place there. The giants then are annihilated, okay? Not totally. You know, it will take more time Okay, remember we said some of them retreated to Ashdod, some of them retreated to these, they, these cities that became the Philistine centers, and it takes David's mighty men to finally eradicate them completely. And what happens to the souls of these Nephilim? The souls of these dead Nephilim continue as demons. And that's the answer of where we get these demons. So, Look at these different fallings. When we talk about the powers of darkness, so you're talking about the prince of the power of the air. You're talking about Satan, right? Then you're talking about sons of God that came and made a covenant, came down, copulated with women, and precipitated that wickedness that led up to the flood. All flesh is destroyed there, right? Then we have God still working with all of humanity, but there's no repentance, and so by the time we get to chapter 12 
At the end of the Babel event, God is done working with all of humanity. He's basically saying, I'm going to make one nation, and I will call them unto myself, and I will create out of this one guy an entire people group. The nations are divorced at that time. They receive their inheritance, and they are allotted to these lesser gods. If you're confused on that, go back and listen to the last two lessons. They are allotted that period of time, but they become corrupted, these gods. They were supposed to encourage righteousness and looking after the poor and the needy, but they didn't. They were drunk for self-worship, and they are excoriated by God in Psalm 82. They're condemned. Are they still around? Yeah, they are. They're still there. Then as we move forward, you've got that group. Then you've got uh, us moving into uh, the patriarchal uh, uh, period of time here. And once again, you have another fall of the sons of God that copulate with women. <sighs> we don't have a whole lot of information on that as we did with the others. We are presupposing that because there's no other way we end up with the Nephilim who are definitely identified as giants. It's everywhere, every direction we could possibly go. They're definitely identified as giants. They're a race of freaks. And the only way you get them is by this situation that occurred. So, consequently, those people groups are annihilated, but then we end up with demons as well. So, what you end up with this chart is you're seeing multiple fallings of the, of the sons of God, some of which ended up in resulting of demons. I think the demons are the lowest ones on the totem pole. They're all subservient to Satan, but they're at the bottom of the pecking order, I think. <laughs> But when the scripture talks about the powers of darkness, or use Paul's language, world forces of darkness, okay, of this present darkness, all of those kinds of, of those languages, this is what he's talking about. This is how, when we talk about Satan and his minions, where did they come from? This is it. This is where they come from. So when you look at that on one page now, you can see everything that we've been working on all the way back to lesson number six and moving forward, dealing with these powers of darkness of how they came about. So let me pause there. Do you have any questions on that? It's such a clear chart, you have no questions. <laughs> yes, hold on, we'll get, get your mic. Not, not so much the chart, but I just curious, these sons of God that have fallen and they take your dominion, are you saying that Every single one of them were fallen. I know we're going to get into the heavenlies next week, but some of not, them that chose not to? Not all of the sons of God fell. There's still a divine council, and there are legions. Jesus said uh, he could call on, what, 10, 10 or 12 legions if he needed to. Uh, there's a host of them. I don't even know the number that are loyal to God. But some of them have fallen, and they fell at different times and they did different things. But the ones that copulated with women are not the ones that we're talking about that are in charge of the nations. That was a separate thing. Well, my question is more so, I know they've fallen and many have been corrupt. Were there ever any that had fallen that were not corrupt at that time? Well, I'm using the word fallen and corrupt as it's synonyms. One and the same. One and the same. Okay. Only thing I can tell you is when God assigned them, when God assigned them, they were all good. Okay? But, but they fell. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, it's like me coming up, you know, you, you're a boss, right? And you say, I look, I'm going away, but, you know, I got a 10 of you here. Here's what I want you to do. And I want you assigned over here. I want you over there. I want you to do this, okay? And this is what you're supposed to do. And then I come back a little later, I'm looking around. You're not doing anything I told you to do. Nothing. Done. Well, my question isn't about the chart. It's something else. Should I wait? Uh, wait to the end. Anybody else on the chart? Yeah, go ahead. So what is the number of these demons? Are, are there enough, I guess, to, to cover the whole world, the whole earth, you know, to... 
what be you know serving Satan. Yeah, and there's some places in the world that even have a greater concentration of the powers of darkness. And these all came from the the nep the, 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 nep the, the yeah. if they're demons. Nephilim, yeah. They're from the Nephilim. And there's that many that they were produced. Then. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. And Jesus said, you know, he had one, one, one teaching. He was saying, look, you know, you got a guy and, and the demon is uh, uh, exercised out of the person. It wanders around. Where does it go? Mm -hmm. Waterless places. It's in the mm -hmm. desert, you know. He comes back, looks at the house. Hey, mm -hmm. it's been swept clean. He brings seven more with him. Worse than he was. Mm -hmm. Are, can they be, are there gradations of wickedness? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't wickedness enough? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is how bad we're talking here, right? And this is one of the things I've been trying to do in this class. I want to sensitize you to the issue of the concern that we all deal with every single day, temptation. I want you to get, is it fixed in your mind, that whatever it is that you're being tempted to do, what it, there is something behind that that is profoundly wicked. It's shielded from your eyes. You can't see it. All you can see is what your flesh craves and what your flesh craves. This, this can't be that bad. It's got to be pretty good. It's only one thing. You know, it's only, it's on, it's only one profoundly evil. Profoundly evil. And when these, when these beings give themselves over, there's no return. I mean, they are all in, and they live for each day. Now, do they know the scripture here, that there's been defeat? You know, we looked at this several weeks ago when uh, Jesus comes into the Decapolis, and the one speaks up and says, have you come to torment me before the time? They, they know. They know. Okay? But the time isn't yet. And so, like, every single human being that's in sin lives in denial. I am one heartbeat away from being found out of whatever the sin that I'm involved in. Just one, it could be known, right? But we live in denial of it. And that's what we're trying to learn as far as growing up in Christ. We don't want those kinds of roots in our life. But sometimes it does happen. Denial is a powerful thing. Because we live in the present and we think we can get away with it because up to this point we have. Anyone else? Yes. Hold on. Very um, earthy, but is there a certain pecking order in heaven with these demons? Do they know their place? I think they do, and I think there is a pecking order. I think the demons are the lowest on the totem pole. I think the regional authorities that are over the nations are certainly higher, mm -hmm. okay? And, I, and then I think you've, you've got, even above that, you may have another rank in there, and of course you've got Satan that's there. But keep in mind, Satan is a created being. Right. He, he is not, neither are any of these beings, omnipresent, as mm -hmm. is Yahweh, right? Mm -hmm. So how does he exercise power? Through his minions. And I, and I think, and I don't know if I use this illustration or not, but I mean, the, 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 when Dieter and I, on the earlier days, when we went over to Russia, certainly after the, um, the um, Iron Curtain coming down at that period of time, what was interesting is that in all these cities, you'd have these major areas, Max knows this, the, the, you, people come together and you have, uh, you know, roads that are coming together and there'd be a circle there and there's a monument, okay? And you have pictures of Stalin, you know, or, you know, it, uh, it, it would be the, the Russian authority there. And when Stalin was in power, I mean, you had these things everywhere. The idea was that when the people drove by there and saw that image, it was reminding them who's calling the shots, okay? Well... In the unseen realm, it's not a statue. It's a power. It's a being that is hostile to God. One more, right here. Is it safe to assume that um, Satan, when you, the gods were put in control of the different countries and that, is it safe to assume that Satan had um, his hand in dealing with them and manipulating? Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I think he had his hand in the, the original 
the agreement that came down where we had, uh, according to at least Enoch and some, a couple other books, you had 200 of them came down, uh, or 20 of them, excuse me, they came down and copulated with women and produced this first problem we had in Genesis chapter 6. Um, it says that, I think it was Shimahaza is the name that's used there. You know, I'm, I'm, gonna, ma I'm gonna do this agreement, I'm gonna go, but what, what if I go and do this and then you guys don't call on me, you know? And so they come up with this covenant. I think he was involved in all of that. Yeah. Now listen, you know, what do you need for a rebellion? You need, you need a persuasive, charismatic leader. You need someone that's a wordsmith. You need someone that is a good orator, somebody that can make an argument, right? That's the power of Satan. He's known as the deceiver. Okay, that's the main thing he's got up his sleeve. It's deceiving. It's persuasive speech. And all of them carry that out. So, in the next temptation that comes your way, this is not really a big deal. It's not going to matter that much. But it is a big deal. Now, having gone through the chart, I want to return now because I want to finish this, this particular lesson with the story of the Danites. And I noticed I picked up a spelling error in there in your notes. It says Damites, D-A-M. It's actually D-A-N, the Danites, okay? I want to look at the sad story of the Danites as it relates to this whole thing of geographical dominion. Okay, we, there's a spiritual compromise regarding this tribe that ends up in idolatry, which was facilitated again by geographical dominion. Here's the background. The Danites eventually settled in the wrong location. <laughs> we'll look at that in a second. Let me give you some of the background on the name. Dan means judge, okay? Dan means judge. Dan is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? It's the largest tribe, second only to Judah. During the first census upon leaving Egypt, their numbers were 62,700. You've got it in Numbers chapter 1. And in the second census, they were numbered at 64,000 plus, Numbers 26. This tribe gained notoriety from two heroes. Number one, Samson came from this tribe. And number two, Ahaliah came from this tribe. Now Samson was a Nazarite. That's a voluntary vow. It's instituted in the law, Numbers chapter 6, 1 to 21, and the idea was to be wholly set apart for God. If you know anything about the story of Samson, probably not the best example of that. Nonetheless, he was a Nazarite. Yeah, well, more at the end of his life. Number two, Ahaliah is interesting. He also is from the tribe of Dan, and this is the guy that is put in charge of overseeing the construction of none other than the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 31. Now, the other things of interest regarding this tribe is, is Jacob. Do you remember that part at the end of the book? We're getting to the end of Genesis, and he's blessing every one of the, of the boys, you know, that become the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, Dan ends up with a really weird kind of a blessing. Have it here, Genesis chapter 49. I don't have it on the screen, just listen to it. Genesis 49, 16 to 18. Jacob is speaking. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Then verse 17, Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heel so that his rider falls backward. For your salvation I wait, O Lord. You know, it is, you know, can you picture the generations that are looking back on this like, well, this is a little weird. I mean, it's not like 
hey, you're going to have, you know, fields of grain that are going to go on for, you know, on and on and on, or your borders are going to be increased. We got this language in here. So let's look at it. Well, the judgment part was certainly realized. It was realized through Samson. Samson became known as a judge, right? Judges chapter 15, verse 20. Uh, you could read that whole section in there regarding the book of Judges. We've got that. But what about the serpent? What about that? The sense seems to lack faithfulness, and it harks back to Genesis chapter 3 with the serpent. So what's going on here? Well, look at the map. See it on the screen. After the conquest of the promised land, Dan was assigned territory west of Jerusalem, west of Ephraim, and bordering the Mediterranean Sea. They were to be seafarers. So you see it there. It's on the left-hand side. You've got the red mark there, and it'll be marked for those of you that are watching online. That is the land that they were delegated and told to live in. However, Dan did not drive out the Amorites and was forced to live in the hill country. They would not fight to restore order during the days of Judges. You remember Judges? It's like it really hard to tell the good guys from the bad guys in that good book. 350 years, and you got Israel. Oh, they're oppressed, they're oppressed. They cry, God, God, please. God raises up a judge. They, they weep, they repent, and then they go right through the same process again. Okay, well, Dan was in the middle of all that. They remained in their ships when they should have fought. The tribe eventually uprooted itself and headed north. Now, this is, this is really off the chart. I mean, we don't have a record of any other thing else happening like this. Here's this tribe that's given its own portion of land. This is your place. They don't conquer it, and finally they get foot, put up, uh, fed up with the, the oppression that they're facing. We're just going to leave. They eventually headed north. What did they do? They stole a backslidden priest's idols and eventually annihilated an entire people group and took over their land. They became the first tribe to embrace idolatry. They took the city of Lar Lar Larish and renamed it Dan. You can read about it, Judges chapter 18. Take a look at the next map. The area here is located at the foot of, you guessed it, Mount Hermon. The land originally had been given to Naphtali, but they didn't do a great job in getting rid of the people groups. And we know that this area was spook central of the ancient world. The land was originally given to Naphtali. There are three tributaries from the water of Mount Hermon that flowed through this territory, and the largest of the three was called the Dan River. And here's what's interesting about this. This becomes a phrasing. As biblical history moves forward and they talk about the nation and the size that it has, they always talk about this Dan to Beersheba. Dan to Beersheba. Dan to Beersheba. That designation of Dan in the northern part is not where they're supposed to be. But they went up there and situated themselves there and were such a presence there, that became known as the northern border of Israel. And when they talked about it to Beersheba, that was the reference that was given. When you go to Israel and you're on uh, some kind of a study tour there or you're going to school and you're in, uh, you're in northern Galilee, they're going to take you to tell Dan. I mean, that's one of the first things they're going to do. Remember, a tell is an archaeological site. Dan is the location. Why are they going there? Because some of the worst human sacrifice happened in this area. This is where this tribe ended up. And it's listed, it's known for this. 
The tribe later became, just tell me all this fits, it became part of the 10 tribe rebellion that followed Jeroboam. Remember that? New worship sites under the, Lord, the, uh, the uh, leadership of Jeroboam. They couldn't go to Jerusalem because that was in the south. The new, new worship sites were, were located. Here's where they were. Bethel and Dan. Now, where was God to be worshipped? We've got Nahum, a pagan, that's saying, would you please give me some dirt from here that when I go back home, I want to worship Yahweh there? Okay? Do you want to talk about the going the wrong direction here? Major idolatry occurred. You can read it again, Judges 18. And the idolatry was fomented by Jonathan, which who's interesting. He comes along. Who's he? He is the son of Gershom, and Gershom was the son of Moses. And this family, Moses' family, had a long history for the potential of idolatry. Remember Aaron? Okay, that was his uncle. The tribe of Ephraim, I'm sorry? Jonathan was the son of Gershom, who was the son of Moses. Gershom is the son of Moses. The tribe of Ephraim, which was located right beside the original site of Dan, was the source of the stolen idol. This is all in Judges, chapter 18. And they assume control over the land originally intended for Dan. So Ephraim moves over there. Idolatry results. And as a result, God had just cause to exclude them from the symbolic list of tribes that's given in Genesis, at Revelation chapter 7, verses 5 to 8. The 12 tribes are listed there. And there is no Dan. And there's no Ephraim. They end up located in the region where you have a spiritual abscess in the land of profound wickedness. And they themselves be no, become known for the height of human sacrifice. Tell Dan. Now, let me give you on the screen additional scholarship regarding the nations allotted to these lesser Elohim. This is Christopher Wright, the International Bible Commentary. Quote, there is no possibility that Yahweh's, Yahweh is simply one of the sons of God to whom the nations are allotted. The point is that the one and only God known to Israel as Yahweh is the same most high God who is sovereign among the nations of humanity. J.A. Thompson in the Tyndale uh, commentary. Some of these I have on the screen, some I don't. That God ordained a plan whereby the number of the nations corresponded to the number of the sons of Israel. However, as we study this, in the Septuagint, the reading to be followed, there may be some idea of supervising heavenly beings, a kind of guardian angel in view. That was the case I made. Dana Thompson writes on this theoretical commentary in the Bible. She says, what is especially noteworthy here is the reference to God's apportioning of the rest of the people of the world to other gods. It is clear that Israel is God's own portion, and at the same time, God is also presented as having given other peoples to other gods. When we link Deuteronomy 32, 8 together with these passages, it supports the existence of these other religions. Then I've got this on the screen, Deuteronomy 4, verse 19. We've looked at this, but we'll look at it again. And beware, Moses says in a sermon, not to lift up your eyes to the heavens and see the sun, the moon, the stars, all the host of heaven, and be drawn away and worship them and serve them those which the Lord God has allotted to the peoples under the whole heaven. Okay? To prove this to you, 
Doesn't the sun and the moon and the stars, don't they all shine over all of the land? Didn't they shine over Israel? He's talking about these powers. They've been allotted. They've been designated for that. Don't be drawn away to them. God allotted them to these people groups. But see, the rebellion's taken place. Moses is talking to the people now. You're going into the promised land. You've got to live differently. Don't follow these pagans. There were, these gods were over Egypt. Ten plagues that destroyed them. These gods were over Egypt. They are over the promised land. They're in all around the lands that are around them. F.F. Bruce, scholar, he says, if the RSV follows the Septuagint in relating these activities, it is that of the heavenly council. Here's Peter Craggy in the International Commentary on the Old Testament. Quote, I think I've got this on the screen. God has given the title Elion, Most High, which is used only here in Deuteronomy. The title emphasizes God's sovereignty and authority over all nations, whereas in relationship to his own people, he is called Yahweh or Lord. All nations received their inheritance and had their boundaries fixed by the sovereign God whose role was in no way restricted to the sphere of Israelite life and history. The boundaries were fixed according to the number of the sons of God. The exact sense of the phrase is difficult to determine, he concedes, but the reference seems to be to the divine counsel of the Lord. His counsel consisted of holy ones and who are called angels, in the Septuagint, the poetry indicates that the number of the nations is related to the number of these sons of God. Again, chapter New Deuteronomy 33, 2 and 3, the people affirm the role of the members of the divine council in assisting Moses' task. His God, that is God's holy ones, are at your right hand. The reference is, uh, is to the assistance given Moses by members of the divine council. Deuteronomy 32, the whole text reads this. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Mount Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand there was flashing of lightning for them, and indeed he loves the people. All your holy ones are in your hand, and they followed in your steps. Everyone receives his words. The loyal sons of God to Yahweh looked after you too. We got to remember that as you look at your own life. Never forget that the power utilized by God here to hold on to you is the power that he used to hold on to the nation of Israel amidst all of these pagan gods around them. John 20, we pick it up here, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. God had to have his hand on those who were elect out of the nation of Israel to hold on to them tightly, otherwise they were going with everybody else. It's the same power that's used in your own life to this day. Now, how are we going to apply this? Well, I think particularly as we think about the Danites, I want to suggest this to you. The Danites were given an allocation. They were given a call. They were supposed to be in a geographic region and they were told what to do. You need to annihilate these people from this land. But it was hard. It was difficult. And they didn't do it. And then they decided, I'm leaving. I'm going to go a different way. And they did, and they made things worse. I want to submit to you that every one of us have various calls that God has given us. And a lot of times we're tempted. I ain't staying. 
I'm getting out of here. It's too tough. Now, we've got to be careful here. There are times that it could be the leading of the Lord to cut bait. It's when you've got to have other friends that you trust in the Lord to tell you what you don't want to hear, perhaps, or also the leadership of the church to pray with you about what it is that you're considering. But what I want you to meditate on right now is that we often think when it, there is adversity, it's not a place for me to stay. I'm leaving. Adversity may be the very thing that God is confirming this is exactly where you're supposed to be. You gotta think about that in your own life. I mean, every single one of us, you know you've been called into the kingdom. We're all here. We all love the Lord. We know it comes from God. He does that. And he calls us to certain ministries or callings, and they're often difficult. And this is what I want you to understand, that adversity is not an evidence that you're in the wrong place. It may very well be indicating this is exactly where you're supposed to be. And oftentimes, we end up leaving and we make our state worse than it had been before. Now, the Danites is extreme. I mean, it is extreme. I mean, they, they left, they plunged themselves into idolatry, they went and annihilated a people group, took over a whole city, renamed it after themselves. You know, this is extreme. And they're cut out. <laughs> they're not even mentioned in the book of Revelation. I think in our lives, it's not a case of us being cut out, but we end up sometimes bringing a level of suffering into our lives that was not necessary. The ploy is always going to be, this is too tough, I'm leaving. It could be the leading of the Lord, but often it's not. God uses adversity to shape our life. He molds us. It's a pressure treatment that's there. You know, and I could tell you about different junctures of my own life where I had to, I've had to learn that the hard way. But there are a number of other testimonies of saints that you could be listening to to tell you the same thing. Adversity often is an indication you're exactly where God wants you to be. The temptation is there's got to be a better way. This is the wrong land. It's too tough. And all the while, it's that what drives us to our knees, where I have to trust God even more to get through a day, to do what it is that God's called us to do. So as we wrap this up in part of our study, I wanted to leave you with that thought about not using adversity as a barometer for where you are headed or what you're called to. Adversity often is the way for the people of God. So that brings us to the end of the powers of darkness. Next week, we're going to turn to the heavenly host. Tremendous loyalty to God and tremendous power that's there. We've caught some glimpses of it already. But I'll leave you with this thought. Are there even any secular writers or historians that have acknowledged the heavenly host, the powers that are loyal to God? See you next week. One question. Okay, you talked about Michael being the prince over Israel, right? Protecting Israel. So now, after the cross, Michael still exists. Is he the prince over 
the nation of Israel or us? You know, it doesn't say in scripture. Um, if he's still there, he's looking after the elect that are part of Israel. But as we're going to look at next week, the nation is gone. The nation is gone, and what you have over in the Middle East today is not right in any way, shape, or form what was talked about within the Word of God. Okay, thank you. Okay. See you next week. Lord willing. Lord willing.